Where the Vale of Glamorgan comes down to meet Cardiff Bay, you'll find the small coastal town of Penarth. With the sea on one side and the South Wales valleys on the other, Penarth was ideally placed to become a major port. Indeed, much of its history it owes to the sea. To have a well-known landmark is one thing, to have a well-known sea mark is another, and that's the distinction of St Augustine's Church in Penarth. It's marked on Admiralty charts and has been recognised by generations of sailors as a welcome sign that they were coming home. Penarth was a busy port with Welsh coal shipped from these docks to many parts of the world. When the mines closed, the docks lay derelict for years, but in the 1980s were redeveloped into a marina, a sign of the prosperity which returned to the town with the growth of the new leisure industries. Just over there is the island of Flat Home, which earned its place in history in 1897 when a 21-year-old Italian called Giuliano Marconi made the first ever radio transmission across water from the mainland to the island. The fact that he did it at all is really quite remarkable, not least because when he arrived in England, the customs smashed his radio equipment, thinking he was an Italian spy and up to no good. Penarth today is one of South Wales' most popular resorts, the Victorian pier being given a new lease of life with some major restoration. When the paddle steamer Waverley comes across the bay on its regular summer trips, it seems almost as if nothing much has changed since its 19th century heyday. So, let's now join the people of Penarth with the Antiques Roadshow experts. Now, this is a truly remarkable service because when you look at it, you would be forgiven for supposing it was made of a very fine porcelain and from one of the grand factories. And in fact, as you know, it's made of creamware, pottery, and it comes from a sort of second rank factory. And we can see this from the way it's marked. It comes from Davenport. Yes. The shapes are the classic ones of about 1820, 1825. You find them in porcelain and in the best creamware. What is unusual in a creamware service is to find a solid brown colour. And it's harder to apply it to pottery than it is to porcelain. And that is why, in fact, it has a rather gritty effect, I think. It hasn't sunk into the ground as well as it would on porcelain. And so you've got most of the service? Yes, most of it. You've got a centre... This is a centre dish. Yes. And you've got... Three of those. Three of those. There would have been four, therefore. Yes. Yes. Three of those. There would have been four, and they would have had baskets on them. Yes. And they are stands yes. for baskets. And 11 of those. And 11 of those. And there are no other shaped dishes. I don't think no. so, no. But three sauce tureens covers and stands like this alone are worth £1,500. Good gracious me. And they are the most expensive bits. Yes. But everybody likes to have them. That is probably worth £250. If you put these in at £100 each, you're, you're getting up to yes. four, three thousand. Three and a half to four thousand pounds is what the service seems to be worth. Good gracious me. These belong to both of you then? Yes, that's right. Well, they're lovely things actually. But of course, one should say, I think, that if they were modern ivories, the situation would be quite different, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. Definitely. Are you taught at school about protection of elephants and ivory and so forth? Yes. Yeah. yeah. What do they say at school? In my day, when I'm at school, and we were never taught this sort of thing. Well, um, you shouldn't take modern ivory because it's unfair on the elephants. They are endangered species. Yeah, that's absolutely right. um, they shouldn't just be killed for um, some little ornament to put on your mantelpiece or dressing mm. table or something like that. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Of course, elephants are protected. But in these in the, day, the days when that was carved, of course, that wasn't the case because that was carved about a uh, hundred years ago. Yeah. So there were no protection laws then. Well, this, this is a much the nicer of the two, so we'll put that to one side, but... Uh, and this chap, he's a woodcutter, isn't he? Yes. And he's actually having, not a tea break, he's having a sake break. He's a quick, going to have a quick swig of sake here, his cup's missing, actually. Yeah. But this thing here is a gourd. And the sake would have, well, the rice wine would have been kept in the gourd. But here he's resting on this, uh, on his, um, on his, the sticks that he's, he's just cut, which are brilliantly done, aren't they? Every single branch, all trimmed. He certainly deserves a sake break, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. 
And you would turn it upside down and we have, of course, a little red lacquer seal, which indicates that it probably made in the Tokyo area and it was a very, very fine quality. It's certainly worth several hundreds of pounds. And I think um, something of the order of not quite a thousand, maybe sort of sort of six to nine hundred, six to eight hundred pounds, say. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> wow. It's exciting. Yeah. Well, I worked for a company which manufactured miners' lamps and uh, they commissioned this drawing uh, to use as a calendar, 1938, I think. And when the company went defunct, um, and the buildings were being pulled down and so forth. Uh, the secretary said, you know, we'd like to have that as a keepsake. There can be very few artists whose names have gone into the common usage in the English language. And William Heath Robinson, I think, must be the, the leading name of that type. He was born in 1872 and uh, trained as a perfectly conventional artist. And in fact, as a young man, illustrated numerous children's books and so on. And really, he came to prominence in the First War, producing these very eccentric cartoons, lampooning all the devices made by the ministries uh, and so on. And we have this wonderful mad scene of a man picking out lumps of coal with his first miner's safety lamp in 1066. Um, he died towards the end of the Second World War. So this is quite a late work. I think it's a, it is a particularly nice uh, subject. It's also in jolly nice condition. And as you know, the history behind it and everything. And I, I, I would imagine that at auction, it would make between eight and 1,200 pounds. And certainly ought to insure it for perhaps as much as 1,500 pounds. Handsome English furniture, just pre-Regency. And this, I think, is the suite. Yeah. Do you use Lucky, it? Isn't it? Uh, no, not really, no, no. I think that's a lovely idea. The idea of cutting this beautiful piece of mahogany originally beautiful, by the maker to have that little writing yeah. uh, compartment, I think is so sweet. Yeah. And of course, it's typical of one maker and only one maker. And I'm sure you've seen and you know Gillow. who it's by. Gillow. Here we are, the Gillow family. Yes. That stamp uh, varies over a period of years. Um, I mean, they later became Waring and Gillow. Yes, I know uh, that. The early part yeah. of this century. Mm, yeah. It, the firm was started by Robert Gillow in, I think, the 1720s. Yeah. This stamp, with just, with just Gillow, is around the period of this table from about 1790 to 1810. Oh! And at one stage they had Gillow Lancaster, yes. and then Gillows with an Gillows, S, which is what we right. call yes, them. Yes, I've read that. But, but yes. his surname is actually Gillow. Gillow. Yeah. But even without that stamp, mm. just looking at this, it's a typical Gillow design. Mm. Is this an old family piece? Well, it has been in my family for a long time, but not my immediate family. Do you have any idea what it's worth? No idea. Sort of thing all that's I know is I like it. What would you guess it's worth today? Oh, gosh, I've no idea. <laughs> no idea at all, no. Well, I'd certainly expect it to make between three and three and a half thousand pounds at auction. Oh, good gracious. <laughs> oh, I didn't think it'd be as worth as much as that. Oh! Uh, this one's to be your... That's the last one. Um, there's glass in there. Yes, that's fine. That can go again. They came into service, I think, in 1831 and didn't go out of service until early this century. Mm. So, with it within that period, and you quite often find in the accounts of various boroughs, certainly one of the Birmingham borough police, there was an instruction that mounted constables carrying these should not hack at the hedges with them because it mm. cost them a halfpenny for the blade to be resharpened. Yeah. So. And they, they've always been eminently saleable as gifts for retiring police officers. Mm. Um, without the scabbard, between 75 and 100 pounds. With the scabbard, add another 75 to it. Mm. Now, Uini is obviously a very important pottery in this area, That's isn't it? Right. I mean, Uini became a pottery that flourished greatly in the late Victorian period when it suddenly became associated with both the local tradition and the making of artwares. And this had become an art pot by the time it was made, which was probably in the 1880s. This is a very splendid piece, um, I say, in a very traditional form. All this irregularity of colour is what you expect. There is some damage on it, yes, the handles have been off. Now, of course, the market for Ueni is exactly here. You know, if I took this to London, it wouldn't fetch nearly so much. But what it wants to do is to go into a, a specialist Welsh pottery sale here, and a local collector might pay, oh, I think, £150, something like that, possibly even more. Obviously, the damage affects it. 
If this was perfect, it would probably be £300. Yes. Most people looking at a dish like this would think, oh, that's a collection plate out of a church. Yeah. In fact, what this is is a rose water dish. Yeah. Now, rose water came about in medieval times for the very simple reason that nobody washed. You will have heard that Queen Elizabeth I used to have a bath twice a year, whether she needed it or not. So that was a good start. <laughs> but the story of this dish goes back way before Queen Elizabeth, where people would go to a, a noble's house for a grand dinner. They would come in from outside, dressed in all their riding clothes. So you would be greeted by a man standing in the doorway with a big dish full of wonderfully scented water, full of rose water or lavender water. And you would wash your beastly, grubby, dirty old hands in the water, and you'd dry yourself on a towel hanging over his shoulder. Then, best bit happened, somebody got hold of a bottle full of nice smelly water, rose water or lavender water, went ah, all over you. Because you smelt so ghastly that if they had lots of you all sitting down in one room together, nobody could breathe. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, dear. But I think this dish dates back to the 17th century. 17th. Yes. Thank you. Then how no, much would it be worth? Well, that's very difficult because there are collectors for old brass, and I think really they are worth quite a lot of money. I can see it making somewhere around about sort of 600 pounds, 800 pounds in auction, something like that. Your lower lip is trembling. Anything else? Oh, sorry. <laughs> 800. This plate looks really fresh and new. Absolutely clean, isn't it? Wonderful. But how long have you had it? About 25 years. Do you know anything about it before that? No, I know nothing about it, except that it's, I was told it was very old. It was given to me by my mother's best friend, and she'd had it given to her by an old lady. Well, and it is a very good example of, of Bristol Delft. Bristol, right. It was made probably in about 1760, between 17... 50 and 1760. And Bristol, Br Bristol the easy to recognize because they use this funny sagey green color. Yeah. And also, they appear to have used a sort of felt pen. Yes, it's got a massive It has massive this funny look. felt yeah. pen effect, doesn't mm. it? The way these strokes are applied. They made blue and white delves and they made colored delves. And the colored delve is very sought after. It's a good size because you get plate size, you get, this is a really generous size. I haven't got my tape measure here, but I must be getting on for 13 inches. Um, I think you should insure it for 800 pounds. Very nice, yes, thank you. Of course, Eric Gill has great relevance as far as the BBC is concerned. He was the sculptor who did all those wonderful sculptings outside the BBC Broadcasting House, as you probably know, yes, yes. yes. Uh, he caused great trouble because he, he refused, to wear, refused to wear trousers. He used to think it was an abomination to wear trousers. And uh, in central London, of course, uh, he had to be shrouded behind the scaffolding while he erected these uh, wonderful sculptures. Anyway, that's by the way. You have got a wonderful collection of letters from Eric Gill and a few of his engravings here. And obviously something to do with the Goupil Gallery, um, who is mentioned time and time again. Mrs. Marchant of the Goupil Gallery. The, the Goupil Gallery was moved from Paris by my grandfather, the uh, uh, husband of um, Mrs. Marchant. Um, he died early in the, the century, but my grandmother, Mrs. Marchant, took over the running of the gallery yes. and um, had all these correspondence with uh, Eric Gill on really main mundane business matters, many of them. This Mrs. Marchant, uh, there was a biography out recently by Fiona McCarthy. Um, didn't he have an affair with your grandmother? Well, it's interesting you mention that. We bought this book for my mother, who has taken a great interest in the affairs of the gallery since she's almost the only living relative. And uh, we thought she'd enjoy this book, knowing her contact yes, with yes. Uh, Eric Gill. When we looked up for references to the family name, we discovered that uh, Eric Gill had claimed to have had a fairly close liaison with my, uh, my grandmother, which was a family surprise. Yeah, I would ask you, yes, yes. Well, anybody who goes around without trousers, I mean, well, what could you say? Well, anyway. Took them off more than one. <laughs> I don't think he ever wore them. Um, <laughs> no, literally, honestly. Um, these little engravings here, these are absolutely wonderful. Um, CM from EG. So these are actually two, yes. your grandmother here. Certainly that one is anyway. It's such a pity about this one here. This is signed by Eric Gill here with the monogram, but it's had um, a rather nasty thing put across yes. it like that. 
Do you have any other? Uh, We've um, not Eric Gill, but these are a collection of various letters from John Nash, another oh, well-known artist good who uh, was again associated very much with the Google. Well, John Nash, of course, um, I suppose he's most famous, or at least I know him, because these are very long letters too, mm. much yes. less like the Gill letters. Love John at the bottom. I, he didn't have an affair with her. Well. Not as far as I'm aware. <laughs> no, I haven't seen any biographies yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, was, um, he was a great war artist. He was one of the official war artists, again. But uh, this, is a, this is absolutely fascinating. Sort of a, a whole history of an art gallery and sort of uh, letters yes. and bits and pieces. Um, these lovely engravings here, which are actually signed by Gill, uh, would be worth a, in the region of a hundred. This one here, because it's a presentation copy, would be worth about 140, 150. Yes. This one, sadly, is an example. I think one could possibly get the stain out, but it would still take away from that, yes. that wonderful engraving, I'm afraid. Would only probably be worth about 40 or 50 pounds. Um, an ordinary Eric Gill letter, I suppose they don't fetch an awful lot of money, but I mean that 40 pounds. But yeah. there again, you do have rather a lot of them. You've got sort of, you flood yes. the market, quite frankly, with 30 or 40 letters. Yeah. Similarly with John Nash. Yeah. He's not going to be expensive as Eric Gill, um, but he's still going to be worth about 20, 30 pounds each. It's a wonderful collection um, and a fascinating, fascinating collection. We keep them out of interest, not out of value. But, uh, I'm delighted to hear it because I, I, you can dip back in all this sort of material and uh, see what life was like mm. in your in the gallery of your grandmother. Uh, well, I know nothing about the vase except that it's in the family for many years, and uh, we've always admired it and had great pleasure from it. And now we want to know the value of it. Well. The thing that attracts me about this is it belongs to a peculiar family of colours, Chinese colours. Yeah. A lot of the colours that we see here are from the Famille Vert palette, especially this green here. And of course we have the classic Famille Rose peony there. And because it's on a black background, it gets the rather fancy name Famille Noir. The black family of enamels. Family, yeah. family Noir was very, very popular in China and in Europe at the end of the 19th century, and this is how old this particular piece is. Uh, it's got these lovely Buddhistic lions gambling through an undergrowth of uh, what appear to be snowballs, flowers in fact, and peonies. And here you have another Buddhistic lion at the bottom there. And then we have this, this is not original to the piece. Did you have this done yourself? No, no, it was on there originally, so we know nothing more about it. Well, originally, at some stage, someone has broken it. Oh. This is usually <laughs> the fate of lids. They get broken yes, at some stage right. in their lifetimes. Yes. And unfortunately, in breaking the lid, they also appear to have broken rather badly the rim. Yes. But judging by the color of the repair up there, um, I would have thought that was done quite a long time ago. Oh, a Not long, long after it was made. No, no. It has quite a severe effect on the value of the piece. Does it? Yes. Uh, I might just point out that someone has rather cleverly taken what was a stand from another vase. Yes. That is actually a stand. Oh. And they've discovered that the rim uh, fits perfectly on there. So they've done that to it. Yeah. And I suspect that that was possibly the lid from the missing vase that we don't know what it looks like. Uh, it's a European piece of pseudo ormolu which just sort of neatly fits in there and it keeps the jar as a potpourri. Yeah. Uh, you could pick up something like this for maybe somewhere in the region of five or six hundred pounds. Ah, right. Six hundred pounds, yeah. Do you keep yeah. fragrant rose petals in or anything no, like that? No, I don't, but I will now. You will? Oh, <laughs> yes. jolly good. <laughs> the, the brooch is uh, Russian. It has been in my family for a long time. I had it valued in Poland and I was told that it may be a, a, a Fabergé brooch, but they were not sure about that. Uh -huh. mm. And what, what about the other pieces? Oh, uh, a set of jewellery I was given by my husband for our third wedding anniversary and it was bought uh, in a shop in Warwick. Right. <laughs> but that's the box. That's the difference, actually. I mean, immediately one looks at a piece like that, it stands out as Russian. Uh, these most certainly are not Russian, these are English. Yes. Uh, the nice thing about them is that you've got very pretty opals put mm. together there, uh, and they've set off very well with the rubies and the diamonds in the centre. Very pretty little suite and a nice design 
with the drop earrings. Uh, a set like that today, I would have thought something approaching a couple of thousand pounds. But the piece that I really like is the Russian piece. I mean, when you look at it, it's so simple. There's nothing there That's at right. all. Uh, but it shrieks of quality. You've got this lovely beaded edge, a nice little cabochon sapphire in the centre, beautiful enamelin, and on that pin, there's a little K and a crown, and that's the abbreviated version of Fabergé's mark. Oh, I see. He only put that on these very small pieces. The other bigger pieces were signed in full. And again, when I looked at the end of the pin here, you can see the, the Russian gold standard, the 56 standard for Russian gold. So it's, it's a lovely piece, and I do envy you that. I mean, oh, although you. I like the opals, this to me is a collector's piece. Uh, and today, I suppose, if that came up, you'd certainly get something reasonable about a thousand, possibly up to fifteen hundred pounds for it. It's a lovely piece, and thanks for bringing it in. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, Clive, we asked you to bring along one of your favourite things, and you brought this, which is very interesting. But what on earth is it? Well, th this is a Bambara headpiece, um, which is from the Bambara tribe in West Africa, Nigeria and is used by the young farmers of the Bambara tribe at their various ceremonies twice a year. And where did you find it? On some uh, safari to Africa? Not Africa, but San Francisco. Um, I was in a shop and I saw it and I had to buy it. My wife said I couldn't possibly bring it home. I said yes I could and we had it on board with us. And it actually, although it doesn't look particularly fragile, is because I thought when I first picked it up that it was going to be a very heavy piece. In fact, it almost floats off the floor. It does. It? Well, you see, they've got to wear it on their head. They wear it with sort of uh, raffia, a raffia headdress at the bottom here, mm -hmm. with loads of dreadlocks around, and they dance around, pretending to be this spirit, which this represents, Shewara, the spirit of the wind. And the idea is that the spirit of the wind helps them with their agriculture in the early days. And twice a year, when they uh, sow their seeds and when they reap, uh, they go around pretending to be this spirit. They're a very spiritual people. They, uh, they believe that by doing this, they can actually activate the spirits to help their agriculture along. So it's, it's all mixed up with African mythology and superstition. And absolutely, so that's absolutely right. And is it particularly old? Well, um, I think it is old, actually. African art is derivative, and people always say, oh, yes, it's bound to be modern. But in fact, in this case, if you look at the, uh, the eye here, there's a little bit of trade cloth showing, a little mm. red piece of trade cloth. Mm -hmm. Well, trade cloth was used in the 19th century, the Europeans trading with the Africans, bright red cloth, and this was what they used on that. You don't see it in any of the later ones, so that's how I know that it is of a good age. So how does a, a pot from the frozen north end up in South Wales? I don't really know, but I had it off my mother-in-law, from my mother-in-law. Uh, so it's an heirloom. Mm. It's been passed down the family. Yeah. Well, Pilkington's, um, I mean, they started off as a, as a tile-making concern, and um, they introduced a, a, a man from Wedgwood, I think in the 1890s, a man called uh, William Burton, who was a chemist, and something of a writer as well on, uh, on ceramic history. And he was the new driving force at Pilkington. And by the way, Pilkington's pottery, nothing to do with Pilkington's glass. The number yeah. of times that people talk about the connection between yeah. the St. Helens firm, as far as I'm aware, there's no great connection. Um, but either way, William Burton arrived and he transformed um, the, um, the products that they were making there and started the art pottery, employed a whole list of very, very talented artists. Um, but I have to say, uh, of all the artists, one of my firm favourites is Richard Joyce. And I think it's fair to say this is almost without doubt the work of Richard Joyce. Um, decorated in luster technique, um, I mean, Pilkington's made a whole range of wares, but it's their luster wares which collectors go for. But th let's just look at the fish. Um, some of them are quite ferocious looking, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. Um, they all look as though, well, even the little ones look looks as though they could possibly be piranha, don't yeah, they? Yeah, quite evil. Uh, I mean, I think this fellow down here um, is particularly yeah. vicious looking, this one down here. And what I like is the way that they've actually picked out in this blood red color, the decoration, so that one can date the piece from the mark, which is just under the glaze. I would suspect this dates from around about 1920, just after the First World War. And there, in a small panel, um, is the monogram of Richard Joyce, um, an unsung hero, really, of ceramic decoration and a master of uh, the, the technique of luster decorating. Um, 
I suppose when it comes to money, um, I would certainly envisage this at auction attracting a bid in the region of a thousand pounds. Well, after all the heavy intellectual content of the roadshow, I thought we'd have a bit of light relief. <laughs> Perennially popular puppies. And what do you think of it? Uh, well, uh, not very much. My, my son really uh, thought it was worthwhile. And you've got it, uh, have you just received it or you've left it? Well, my the brother died and uh, I've inherited it, you see. And uh, he hasn't really bothered very much about it. It was put, you know, in, in a cupboard and that was it. Uh, I don't know whether you've noticed this, it's signed and dated Claude Hunt, 1906. And we can see here, under all this muck, how beautifully these dogs are painted. And another thing that uh, an artist uh, should do if he's a dog painter who wants to give the pictures value is to give them a sort of human quality. And of course, Lancia was the great man for that. But these dogs do have a human quality. And of course, there's a subject matter. It's the old dog in the manger. Um, he's not going to let anyone, he's, he, he's not going to let anyone near his bones, but the other one's pinching it from behind. And it's, uh, you can find all of human life in this picture. Now, you may think that because this picture has been mistreated, which I would say it has. It has, yeah. <laughs> that, that it detracts from the value. But in, in another way, uh, because it actually hasn't been touched, re-cleaned, um, it helps the value to a certain extent. Now, the hunts are very sought after. Not by your family. No, but I'm by, not. by the general public. <laughs> And a picture like this is worth six to seven thousand pounds. Good gracious me. Well, I was on the point of throwing it out, but my son said, I think it's of some value. And that's why we're here tonight. The model is based on the most famous British radio ever made. Is it? Did you have it when you were small? Uh, uh, yes. You yes, did? Yes. Um, in 1934 or 35, an architect called Wells Coates designed a round Bakelite radio for Echo. You know, you've heard the radio company called Echo. And it's the most collectible radio of all time now. But what I've never seen before is a money box based on that radio. And I think that's great. And on the back, it's got this wonderful instructions. And it says, when you put 60 pence in, the door opens automatically and it works. I mean, it's, it's, it's very collectible as a money box. It's also great for a radio enthusiast like me. In collector terms, oh, I would think there's at least um, 50 pounds there, regardless of what you put in it. I think what this is was a treasure box. It was for keeping money or jewellery in. Yes. Something precious. Can you hear that? Treasure because, box. Because what we've got here are all these metal bands. Yes. Cast iron, tough things. Yes. Wonderful carving. Yes. It's extremely old. Yes. How old? Um, well, I would guess somewhere around about 1500. Let me jot it down. I've got a lousy memory. Right. 1500. Put it on your list. Um, I also think it's German. I thought that, yes. But the best bit of all for me, excuse me doing this to your box, is the bottom. Why? Well, what we often look for in something like this is authenticity. You want it to look ancient. If you're imagining you're trying to date something, everything yes. has to be old. Yes. Looking around here, we've got pieces of wood which have broken off. We've got lovely woodworm holes. We've got ads marks where the guy actually carved this with a tool. He wasn't making it on a machine, he was making it by hand. Yes, yes. And it quite possibly came from a part of the world where carving was second nature. Everybody carved. Black All forest? the men. Probably Black Forest or somewhere like that. Yes. What I like is this man and this woman here holding scrolls, these two. Yeah, I see them. They're lovely. Yeah, Adam and Eve, do you think? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Could be. It could be. Could be. Well, how did you come by it? Did you I have your bought it at an auction for 30 shillings? Did you? You bought it? When was that? 20, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, 30 shillings. Well, I think your 30 pieces of silver have gone up a bit since then. I think we're looking at a box here which, if it went into a sale in Germany, because that is where the market is for things like this, yes. would be worth somewhere around about 1,500, 2,000 pounds English. Would it? Yes. Let if me drop that down. 1,500, 2,000 pounds. 
This is so delightfully understated. The, the size is nice too. Mm -hmm. Just a little, what, six foot high, I suppose. But what really catches my eye immediately is the rounded edge to this. This lovely quarter column here, beautifully fluted after an ancient Grecian column. Yes. But the way it leads down, rounded here as well. Continuing that, they could have easily dropped it into a square carcass. All the way down here, and this lovely OG bracket foot, is called this lovely squiggly serpentine foot, but again in the round, particularly mm. unusual. How old is it in your mind? 1790, somewhere thereabouts. Right, well, the shape of it, I think, makes it a bit earlier than that. Is this it? rounded edge to it mm -hmm. and the type of handles used are much more typical of the 1740s. Are they? So it's quite a bit earlier, a good 50 years earlier than that. Mm. But nothing's been changed. These handles, I don't even need to open the drawer mm. to see if the handle's been changed. You can tell by the colour of the handle, the shape, the fact that there's no, the, the wood is the same colour underneath, it's all even. On this mm. beautiful figured mahogany, it's just quite extraordinary, the fiddling on yes. the mahogany. Mm. Quite early for use of mahogany, the very beginning of the mahogany era. Yes. Do you use this? Oh, yes. You do? All the time. Right, let's see if I can open it. This is just extraordinary. I mean, one's used to a secretaire chest. Do you, what do you call it, a tall boy or...? We call it the desk. The desk, the mm. desk. And this locks... I've never, I've never ever seen a locking mechanism like this and these lovely steel struts here. Mm to not only lock it closed, but to lock it open. But just the shape, the, the details, mm. this little inverted rounded corner here, canted and inverted, yes. every single detail you could imagine. Just beautifully shaped, I mean, extraordinary. Mm. And typical of that 1740s period. Is it, is it a piece you've had in the family for a long time? No, I've had it for about 20, 25 years. What, bought in an antique shop or something? Uh, not in an antique shop, at a country house sale. Oh, right, right. Mm. Oh, it's jolly heavy, isn't it? Yes. So, it's a piece you bought relatively recently? Yes. Do you remember what you paid for it? I think it was about £500. And what have you got in the of today, may I ask? About uh, three and a half thousand. Well, if you multiply that by about three... Really? And say, I would say at least £10,000 from the At least then you might be about right. Mm. And you'll never find another one. No. A Delft vase of about 1670. Lovingly glued together. Yes, my children uh, had uh, their cousins to stay and they all went a bit wild. Tra uh, ran around the house and someone fell and nobody knew, of course, who broke it. <laughs> Two of them were involved, but it took four of them to put it together. Where, where did the vase come from before that? I bought that in 1944 in uh, Cardiff Auction Rooms. Um, just because you liked it or...? Oh, you... yes, yes. It attracted me. All right, let's have a look at the decoration on it. I mean, here, again, copying Chinese, um, the whole idea with Delft was to imitate the Chinese porcelain that was coming into Europe, and you've got mock Chinese figures. But what I think is exciting about these little chaps is the cartoon quality in which they're done. Uh, Dutch Delft vases made in the 17th century can be beautifully painted with Chinamen. Um, I suppose there's a, a vase he's holding or a musical instrument. Uh, have you thought about what these chaps are doing, uh, perhaps? It, yes, it could be either. I mean, here we've got someone definitely proudly holding a vase. Um, looks like he's a China specialist on the Antique Roadshow, I think, very much <laughs> admiring that. But done in a sort of a cartoon way. And oh. it's not really like the Dutch painted it at all. It's much more like, I mean, this chap's straight out of the Beano, isn't it? I mean, he's really an English cartoon <laughs> character. Oh. And I think, therefore, because the way these are done, they're so funny, but this isn't a Dutch one, but it's made by Dutchmen in England, an English version made in London at that time. Good heavens. And that um, makes it so much more exciting to us today, because although um, probably equal rarity, there's far more collectors and enthusiasts for English ones. Um, all the sort of irregularities of it, that it leans a bit, it's uh, irregularly made, but that really is its charm. So, uh, can you remember those years ago, before we got broken, or what it cost you in the auction? Yes, it's £3.50. Well, £3.10 right. in, in those the, days. In those, money in those days. 
I mean, it's sort of tragic to think that it has got smashed. It could be made better. It could be repaired now, not by little hands, but by great Expert. professional hands yeah. who could put these together so you'd hardly know. It would be expensive. But you've got a piece that's worth it because if it's English, then a perfect one, 10,000, 15,000. She was. Even broken, two or three thousand. Wait till I tell the family. <laughs> well, how, how did you come by the picture anyway? Um, I was a taxi driver and uh, carried some bags into a house for a lady. And this was in the hall on the floor. I thought it had fallen off the wall. So I asked her if, I, if she wanted me to rehang it for her. To which she replied she was uh, throwing it out. And uh, to be honest, I bought it for the frame um, and gave her 25 pounds for it. Um, when I took it home, uh, I had to convince the wife that I would find a better picture for the frame. But did you ever go back to her in oh, your yes, research yeah. and ask oh, her yes. where she got it? Oh, yeah. uh, apparently her husband, who was deceased at the time, had bought it in Germany in 1932. Uh, he was a leather dealer. And apparently, according to her, he'd paid 200 guineas for it in 1932. But she's also passed away since, so we'll perhaps never know any more. Well, my first impression of this painting, signed Henri Rousseau, Douanier Rousseau is that it's a fake. The problem with Rousseau is that he's a naive artist. He's a primitive artist. Yeah. Therefore, he paints like an amateur. Now, that doesn't mean to say that he didn't produce some really magic paintings. Of course he did. But he started as an amateur and... And died as an amateur. And died as an amateur. And therefore, he is not a difficult artist to copy, if you know what I mean, oh, I know you know. to a certain extent. And there's nothing a faker likes more than having something relatively easy to copy, which is worth a great deal of money. But what do you think about this painting? According to the expert who saw it for me, uh, and the test we had done, um, they, in his opinion, it's a real one. And which expert was that? Uh, Henry Certigny of Paris. Of Paris, right. And w tell me about the test you had done. Uh, X-ray, ultraviolet scan. Uh, it sat for about four hours under a microscope while the lady uh, who did the, was doing the testing removed some of the varnish uh, and then took uh, the first set of three sets of paint samples which we had uh, sent away. In fact, I ended up going to Paris three times. And what, what were the results of these tests? Basically, um, uh, the expert said that they actually know all the paints he used. Um, apparently, he actually died owing his paint supplier 60 francs or something. So they've got all the bills and they know the colours he used and the paint samples match the colours. Um, and in, in his opinion, it's, it's right. And I, I suppose this has been quite an expensive exercise for you? Um, approximately two and a half to three thousand pounds. At the time, which was five years ago, um, they were, you know, Rousseau's were fetching probably uh, two or three hundred thousand pounds. So, in that context, £2,500, £3,000 was a, a reasonable bet. Um, plus the fact I've been told by, uh, three or four times that it was an old copy. And uh, I don't know, I just, perhaps on the sort that I just want to know for definite. So the problem is that from our point of view, there are thousands of Rousseau's that are not Rousseau's. Right? And... Uh, and many of these Rousseaus were produced in his lifetime with exactly the same sort of paints and materials that he bought himself, because those were the paints available at the time. So that when authenticating a picture, you have to have, most especially in this case, you have to have provenance. You have to know where it came from and be able to trace it back to the artist. And the great problem you are always going to face with this picture is that you haven't got any provenance and the cards are stacked against you because of all the other fakes. Yeah. I bought it for the frame. At the end of the day, I could always uh, put another painting in. <laughs> this must be one of the largest French porcelain and ormolu mantel clocks that I've ever seen. Do you have it working at the moment? No, because the pendulum has come off the pin. And without the pendulum working, of course, the clock don't well, work. Well, that makes sense. But that's a very easy repair, as I'm sure you know. Yes. The quality is wonderful. Starting at the bottom, we've got these magnificent figures, um, obviously angels, stylized, uh, and then running up, just looking at the Ormolu case now, these columns, 
with Corinthian capitals. And then all around here, we have the most superb masks of various beasts. And then running up above the dial area, we've got another selection of small putty. And on top of this dome, a little cherub on its own. But the thing that is amazing quality are these porcelain plaques. What I'm going to do is just to show you inside the clock, see whether we can see a particular mark. And in fact, yep, underneath the movement, the initials AR, which Correct. suggests to me that these plaques were made in Arras, which is about 80, 90 miles north of Paris. Yes. They are not Sevres, as many people would have thought. No. Each of those plaques is individually numbered, 4411, yes. and has the name Bourdin on the plaques. Right. So, do you know what these plaques actually represent, these four? No, I don't. Well, they are the continents. This is how the Europeans perceived the Americas mm -hmm. in the mid-19th century. This um, figure here would originally have been wearing a skirt of tobacco leaves, but now we associate them with feathers. And then round here, we've got uh, Asia, very much right. sort of Turkish garb. And then coming round to the other side, Europe, who is portrayed as being rather more sophisticated with all right. these art trophies down below her yeah. feet. And here, Africa. Huh. All of the most sensational quality, as I say, and the gilding around the outside of this turquoise ground is lovely. lovely. I think it's almost certainly from a model made for the Great Exhibition of 1851. It's an important clock, so had you had it in the family a long time or not? Yes, quite a long time. Uh, Roughly round... how long? Late 40s. Right. Who bought it? Or, or My father it? bought it in Edinburgh, really? in Scotland. And roughly, what did he pay? Do you remember? Or? £75. £75 then. Well, retail price for something like this is going to be in the region of £15,000. So that is actually not a bad return on £75 from the late 40s. No, quite. And you must treasure it and get the pendulum sorted because it's so nice to have it, it working. Do, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our warm thanks to the people of Penarth. One of the things we've learnt yet again today is the importance of that word provenance. You know, a picture or indeed any other work of art may look right. It may indeed be of the right period. But if you don't know its full history, if you don't know where it's been, then inevitably a question mark may hang over it. And that was certainly the case with that picture that the owner hoped was by Rousseau. So one or two disappointments perhaps, but many happy faces as we leave Penarth now en route for North Yorkshire. So until next week at the same time, from all of us here in South Wales, goodbye. <laughs>